Well, welcome back to our class on algorithms and data structures. We have covered a lot of ground in this course, and this will be the, the last um, data type that we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about graphs, and then we'll be talking about graph implementation. And so with that, we'll go ahead and get into this lecture on graphs. So um, here is the textbook chapter contents that we'll be talking about. And so we'll be giving some examples and terminology, terminology to help give us some orientation. We'll talk about traversals. We'll talk, top, talk about topological order, paths, and then um, talk about the, the Java interfaces that we use in the ADT graph. So here's just maybe some, some orientation for you guys to be thinking about. Um, so um, the news media often uses line graphs or pie charts and bar graphs to help us visualize certain statistics. But these common graphs are not examples of the kind of graph that we're studying here. The graphs that computer scientists and mathematicians use include the trees that you saw in, in chapter 24. Uh, in fact, she is a special kind of a graph. These graphs represent the relationship among data elements. This chapter will represent the terminology we use when discussing graphs, the operations on them, and some typical applications. So here's some examples in terminology. Although the, the graphs you have drawn in the past likely are not the kind of graphs we will discuss here, the examples in this section will be familiar but you probably have never called them graphs. And so keep that in mind. So let's give an example of roadmaps. And so in um, figure 29.1, which are shown here, um, it contains a portion of a roadmap for Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Small circles represent the towns and the lines that join them represent the, the roads. A roadmap is a graph. In a graph that the circles are called vertices or nodes and the lines are called edges. The graph then is a collection of distinct vertices and distinct edges. A subgraph is a portion of the graph that itself is a graph, just as the roadmap in figure 29.1 actually is part of a larger map. So since you can travel in both directions along the roads in figure 29.1, the, the corresponding graph and its edges are said to be undirected, but cities often have one-way streets. The graph in 29.2 has a vertex for each intersection in city street map. The edges each have a direction and are called directed edges. A graph with directed edges is called a directed graph or digraph. You can transform an undirected graph into a directed graph by replacing each undirected edge with two directed edges that have opposite directions. So, Let's talk about paths. A path between two vertices is a graph in a sequence of edges. A path is in a directed graph must contain the direction of the edges and it is called a directed path. The length of a path is the number of edges that it co comprises. If a path does not pass through any vertices more than once, it is a simple path. Figure 29.1, it, contains a simple path from pro, um, Provincetown to or Orleans of length two. A cycle is a path that begins and ends at the same vertices. A simple cycle passes through the vertices only once. Figure 29.1, the cycle, um, Chantham, Highness, Barnstable, Orleans, uh, Chantham is a simple cycle. Uh, a graph that has no cycles is acyclic. You can use a, a road or street map to see how to get from point A to point P, B. The path that you choose between these points will usually be a simple path. In doing so, you avoid retracing your steps or going around in circles. People who take a ride to, to view the autumn leaves, however, would follow a cycle that begins and ends at home. Well, let's talk about weights. Um, weights, you might be happy just to get from place to one place to another but you often have a choice of several paths. You could choose the shortest, the fastest, or the cheapest paths, for example. To do so, you would use a weighted graph, which has values on its edges. These values are called either weights or costs. For example, figure 29.3 shows the roadmap from figure 29.1 and has a weighted graph. In this version, each weight represents the distance in miles between two towns. Other types of weights 
you might use could re represent the, the driving time or the cost of the traveling by taxi. A path is in a weighted graph also has a weight or cost that is a sum of the edge weights. For example, the, the weight of the path from Providence to Orleans in figure 29.3 is 27. So um, what about connected graphs? Um, the town on, on a road map are connected by roads on, in, in a way that enables you to go from town to another town. That is, you, you can get from here to there. A graph that has a path between it. every pair of distinct vertices is, is connected. A complete graph goes even further. It has an edge between every pair of distinct vertices. Figure 27.4 provides examples of undirected graphs that are connected, complete, or disconnected. That is, it is not connected. Notice that the, the simple path in part A and the simple cycle in part C. So what about adjacent vertices? Um, two, two vertices are adjacent in an undirected graph if they are joined by an edge. In figure 29.3, Orleans and Chantham are adjacent, but Orleans and Sandwich are not. Adjacent vertices are called neighbors. In a directed graph, vertices I is adjacent to vertice J if a directed edge be begins at J and ends at I. Figure 29.5, Vertice A is adjacent to vertice B, but vertice B is not adjacent to vertice A. That is, vertice A is vertex B's neighbor, but the converse is not true. When convenient, we replace vertice labels within the circles that represent the vertices on figure 29.5, but sometimes the vertice labels will appear next to the circle as in figure 29.3. So let's um, talk about the, the number of edges. If a directed graph has n vertices, how many edges can it have? If the graph is complete, each, each vertice in, in a neighbor of all the, the, each vertice is a neighbor of all the other vertices. Thus, each ver vertex ends um, n minus one directed edges. Consequently, the graph has n times n minus one edges. The complete undirected graph has half that number of edges. For example, the graph in figure 29.4b has four vertices um, and four times three divided by two or six edges. To make the graph directed and complete, we would replace each edge with two directed edges, which results in a graph having 12 edges. Well, what, let's think about airline routes. A graph that represents the route that an airline flies is similar to one that represents a road map. They are different, however, because not every city has an airport and not every airline flies to or from every airport. For example, the graph in figure 29.6 shows a, the flights for a small airline on the eastern coast of the United States. The graph is undirected and consists of two subgraphs that e each are connected. The entire graph, however, is disconnected. And what about mazes? We can represent the, this maze as a graph by placing the vertices at the edge and exit at each turn in the path. And, and each dead end as figure 29.7b shows. This graph, like the road map in figure 29.1, is connected. For, for such graphs, we can find a path between any two vertices, as you will see later in this chapter. What about course prerequisites? Thinking of this in terms of an example, as a, as a college student, you must take a sequence of courses in your major. Each course must, each course has certain prerequisite courses that you must complete first. In what order can you take the required courses and satisfy the prerequisites? To answer this question, we first create a directed path graph to, to, to represent the courses and their prerequisites. Figure 29.8 is an example of such a graph. Each vertice represents a course, and each directed edge begins at a, at a course that is a prerequisite to, an, to another. Notice, for example, that you must complete CS1, CS2, CS4, and CS7, CS9, and CS5 before you can take CS10. This graph has no cycles in, in, a, in a directed graph without cycles. Um, this, this graph has no cycles. In a directed graph without cycles, we can arrange the vertices so the vertice, vertex 
A proceeds vertex B whenever a directed edge exists from A to B. The order of the vertices in this arrangement is called the topological order. Later in this chapter, we will see how, the, how this order and therefore the order in which you should complete your course requirements. Um, we've already talked about trees, but let's um, think about that a little bit more. So um, the ADT tree is a kind of graph that uses parent-child relationships to organize its nodes in a hi hierarchical fashion. One particular node, though, the root, is the ancestor of all the other nodes in the tree, but not all graphs have a hierarchical structure and not all graphs are trees. And for traversals, as you have learned in earlier chapters, you usually search a tree for a node that contains a particular value. Graph applications, however, focus on the connections between vertices rather than the contents of vertex vertices. These applications often are based on a traversal of the graph's vertices. Chapter 24, we examined several orders in which we could visit the nodes of a tree. The pre-order, in-order, and post-order traversals are examples of, in, of, depth, of a depth-first traversal. This kind of traversal follows a path that descends the, the, the levels of a tree as deeply as possible until it reaches a leaf, as figure 29.9a shows. More generally, a depth-first traversal of a graph follows a path that goes as deeply into the graph as possible before following other paths. After visiting a vertex, this, this traversal visits the, the vertex neighbor, the neighbor's neighbor, and so on. The level order tra traversal of a tree is an example of a breadth first traversal. It follows a path that explores an entry level before moving to the next level, as figure 29.9b shows. In a graph, a, a breadth first traversal visits all neighbors of a node before visiting the neighbor's neighbors. Okay, what about a breadth first traversal? Um, given an or origin vertex, a breadth first traversal visits the, the origin and the origin's neighbors. It then considers each of these neighbors and visits their neighbors. The traversal uses a queue to hold the, the visiting vertices. When we remove a vertex from the queue, we, we visit an, an end queue, the vertex in unvisited neighbors. The traversal order is then the order in which vertices are added to the queue. We can ret retain this traversal order in a second queue. And so the, the algorithm we're showing here performs a breadth first traversal of a non empty graph beginning at a given vertex. So, figure 2910 traces this algorithm for a directed graph. A, a trace of a breadth first traversal begins at the vertex A of a directed path. Um, and just a, a note for breadth first traversal a breadth First traversal visits a vertex and then each of its vertex neighbors and before advancing. The order in which these neighbors are visited is not specified and can depend on the graph's implementation. Okay, what about a, a depth first traversal? Given an or origin vertex, a depth first traversal visits the origin, then a neighbor of the origin and a neighbor of the neighbor. neighbor. It continues in this fashion until it finds no unvisited neighbors. Backing up by one vertex, it considers another neighbor. This traversal has a recursive feel since traversing from its origin leads to a traversal from the, its, from the origin's neighbor. It should not surprise you then that we use a stack in the iter iterative description of this traversal. We begin by pursuing the origin um, vertex into the stack. When the vertex at the top of the stack has unvisited neighbors, we visit and push that neighbor onto the stack. If no such neighbor exists, we pop the stack. The traversal order is, in, is the order in which the, the verti vertices are added to the stack. We can maintain this traversal order as a queue. And so the following algorithm what we're showing on the slide performs a depth first traversal of the non-empty graph beginning at a given vertex. So in this figure, it, we um, figure 29.11, we, it traces the algorithm for the same directed graph as in figure 29.10. Okay, let's talk about topological order. Figure 
um, is this uh, that's the section. So in Figure 29.8, it shows a, a graph that represents the prerequisite structure of a group of, of computer science courses. Uh, this graph is a director graph without cycles. Recall that that you can place the vertices of such a graph into a topological order. And just as a, a note, um, a topological topological order of vertices in a directed graph without cycles. Vertis, um, vertex A precedes vertex B whenever a directed edge exists from A to B. The vertex in a graph can have several different topological orders. For example, one such order for the graph in figure 29.8 is CS1, CS2, CS5, CS4, CS7, CS9, CS10, CS6, CS8, CS3. That is, if you complete the courses in this order, you will satisfy all prerequisite. Um, suppose that you can move the vertices in the graph so that they align in this order, stretching the edges as needed. The, the result will be like the, the graph in figure 2912a. Each edge points towards a node that comes after the edge's original node, origin node. You'll be able to find at least one such a arrangement for every directed graph if the graph has no cycles. Figure 2912 shows two other topological orders for a graph in, in figure 298 as well. As is true for, for this example, any topological order is usually sufficient to solve a given problem. Okay, moving on, a topological order is not possible for a graph that has a cycle. If, a, if vertices A and B are on the cycle, A path exists from A to B and from B to A. One of these paths will contradict any order that we choose for A and B. For example, the graph in <clears throat> 2913 that we're showing here contains a cycle. You need to complete CS15 and CS20 before taking CS30 but you need to complete CS30 before taking CS20. The circular logic is caused by a cycle and creates an impossible situation. The process that dis discovers a topological order for the vertices in a graph is called a topological sort. Several algorithms for this process are possible. You can begin a topological sort by locating a vertex that has no successor, that is no adjacent vertex. Finding this vertex is possible because a graph has no cycles. We mark the vertex as visited and push it on to a stack. We continue by finding another vertex U that is unvisited and whose neighbors, if any, are visited. We mark U as visited and push it on the stack. We proceed in this way until we have visited all the vertices. At that time, the stack contains the vertices in topological order beginning at the, at the top of the stack. And so the algorithm we're showing here describes this topological sort. Figure 2914 traces this algorithm for the graph in 29.8. At each intersection of the algorithm's loop, the next unvisited vertex, that is next vertex, becomes sh shaded in the figure as it is visited. The topological order in, in the opposite of the order in which the, the shade shading occurs. In this example, the topological order is the one pictured in 29, figure 29, 12a. So we're just kind of walking through this. This is um, the, some more details. This is part two. We have part three. So you can look these over in more detail at your leisure. Okay, let's talk about paths. Um, learning whether a particular airline flies between two given cities is important to the average traveler. We can obtain this information by using a graph, such as the one in figure 29.6 to represent the airline routes and testing whether a path exists from vertex A to vertex B. If a path exists, we can also find out what it is. If not, any path will do. We can find the, the one that is shortest and cheapest. For, for finding a path, um, for, the, for the moment, we can contend to find any path, not necessarily the best one. Uh, depth first traversal discussed in segment 2913 stays on a path through the graph as it would visit as many vertices as possible. We can easily modify this traversal to locate a path between two vertices. We begin at the, at the origin vertex, 
each time we visit another vertex, we see whether that vertex is the desired destination. If so, we are done and the results resulting stack contains a path. Otherwise, we continue the traversal until either we are successful or the traversal ends. We leave the, the development of this algorithm as an exercise that you can do um, on your own. So what about the shortest path in an unweighted graph? And for, let's consider an example, a, a graph can have several different paths between the same two vertices. In an unweighted graph, we can find the, the path with the shortest length, that is the, the path that has the fewest edges. For example, consider the unweighted graph in figure 2915A. Suppose that we want to know the, the shortest path from vertex A to vertex H. By inspecting the graph, we can see that several simple paths show, shown in part B of the figure are, uh, are possible between these two vertices. The path from A to E to H has length two and is the shortest. So let's talk about the, an algorithm that we could use. So the following algorithm finds the shortest path in an unweighted graph between the vertices of origin vertex and end vertex. Like the breadth first traversal in segment 2912, the algorithm uses a queue to hold the vertices as they are visited. It then uses the, the given um, initially empty stack path to construct the shortest path. When the algorithm ends, the stack path contains the vertices along the shortest path in the origin at the top of the stack. The value returned is the, the length of the shortest path. For developing the algorithm, the algorithm to find the shortest path be between the two vertices is a, an unweighted graph is based on a breadth first traversal. Recall that this traversal visit the origin vertex, vertex, then the origin's neighbors, the neighbors of each of these neighbors, and so on. Each vertex is placed into a queue as it is visited. To find the shortest path, we enhance the breadth first traversal as follows. When we visit a vertex V and mark it as visited, we note the vertex P that we just left to, to reach V, that is pre, P precedes V in the graph. We also note the length of the path that the traversal followed to, to reach V. The length this length is, is one more than the length of the path to vertex P. We place both the, the length and the path to, to V and a reference to P into a, a vertex V. Each vertex then contains its label, the length of, of its path to it, and the vertex that preceded it, precedes it on the path as shown in, in figure 2916. Although a vertex also contains other data fields, we have ignored them in this figure. At the end of, of the traversal, we will use this data in the vertices to construct the shortest path. So let's jump ahead to the part of the algorithm. <clears throat> Figure 2917A, it shows the state of the graph in, in Figure 2915A after the algorithm is traversed from vertex A to vertex H. So, um, Let's um, talk about tracing the algorithm. Figure 2918 traces the steps through the algorithm takes, um, that, that the algorithm takes to produce the path information shown in 29, figure 2917 for the unweighted graph in figure 2915A. After adding the origin vertex A to the queue, we visit the origin's three neighbors, B, D, and E, and then queue them. So, what and uh, let's talk about the, the shortest path in a weighted graph and so be an example in a weighted graph that the shortest path is not necessarily the one with the fewest edges rather it is the one with the smallest edges edge weight sum figure 2919a as we're showing here shows a weighted graph obtained by adding weights to to the graph in figure 2915a the possible paths from vertex A to vertex H are the same as we saw in figure 2915B. This time, however, we list each path with its weights, that is the sum of the, the weight of its edges in figure 2919B. Um, so let's talk about developing the algorithm. The algorithm to find the shortest or cheapest path between two given vertices in a weighted graph is based on a breadth first traversal. It is similar to an algorithm for, for developed for an unweighted graph. 
And that algorithm we noted the number of edges in, in the path that led to the, to the vertex under consideration. Here we compute the sum of the edge weight in the path leading to a vertex. In addition, we must record the cheapest of the possible paths. Whereas before we, we used a queue to order the vertices, this outcome we use a priority queue. Just as a note, in a weighted graph that the shortest path between two given vertices has the smallest edge weight sum, the algorithm to find this path is based on a breadth first traversal. Several paths in a weighted graph must share the same minimum edge weight sum. Our algorithm will find only one of these paths. So continuing on, each entry in the priority queue is an object that contains a vertex, the cost of the path to the to vertex from the original vertex and the previous vertex on that path. The priority value is the cost of the path with the smallest value having the highest priority. Thus, the cheapest path is, the, is at the front of the priority queue, and it is thus the, the first, open, first one removed. Note that several entries in the priority queue might contain the, the same vertex but different cost. At the conclusion of the algorithm, the, the vertices in the graph contain press predecessors and, and costs that enable us to construct the cheapest path, much as we constructed the path with the fewest edges from the graph in figure 2917. Well, let's talk about tracing the algorithm. Figure 2920 traces the, the, the traversal portion of the algorithm for the weighted graph in figure 2919A with vertex A. Um, is the origin. Initially, an object containing A, 0, and null is placed in the priority queue. We begin the loop by removing the front entry from the priority queue. We use the contents of this entry to change the state of the indice indicated vertex A, in this case, in the graph. Thus, we store a path length of 0 and a null pre predecessor into A. We also mark A as visited. So vertex A has three unvisited neighbors, B, D, and E. The cost of the pass from A to each of these neighbors is two, five, and four, respectively. These costs, along with A uh, as the previous vertex, are used to create objects that are placed into the priority queue. The priority queue orders these objects so they are cheapest, so, they, so, so that the cheapest path is first. We remove the entry from the priority queue. The entry contains vertex B, so we visit B. We also store within vertex B the path cost 2 and its predecessor A. Now B has vertex E as its sole and visited neighbor. The cost of the path A to B to E is the cost of the path A to B plus the weight of the edges from B to E. This total cost is 3. We encapsulate E, the cost of three, and the predecessor B into an object that we add to the priority queue. Note that the, the two objects in the priority queue involve vertex, e, vertex E, but the most recent one has the, the cheapest path. We again remove the, the front entry from the priority queue. The entry contains vertex E, so we visit it and store it into E. The path costs three, and E's predecessors B, vertex E, has two unvisited neighbors, F and H. The cost of each path to a neighbor is the cost of the path to E plus the weight of the edge to, to the neighbor. Two new objects are added to the priority queue. The next object re removed from the priority queue contains a vertex E, but since E has been visited, we ignore it. We then remove the next object from the priority queue. The algorithm continues until the destination vertex H is visited. Figure 29.21 shows the, the, the state of the, the graph of the at the conclusion of this trace given in figure 29.20. By looking at the destination vertex H, we can see that the weight of the cheapest path from A to H is 8. Tracing back from A, H to A, we see that the path is A to D to G to H, as we noted in segment 2921. So let's um, talk about the algorithm. The, the, the pseudocode for the algorithm we just describes um, is now what we're seeing on the chart. Objects in the priority queue 
are instances of a private class entry PQ. Following the traversal, the algorithm pushes the vertices that occur along the cheapest path from origin vertex to end vertex into a given initially empty stack path. The origin of the cheapest path will be at the top of the, the, the stack path. At the bottom of the stack is the, the destination vertex. The cost of the path is returned by the algorithm. This algorithm is based on um, Dijakta's algorithm, which finds the shortest path from an origin to all other vertices. So um, this is just continuation of that, what we just spoke about. So you can see that, and here is um, part three. So just um, more of the same details. So let's talk about the, the Java inter interface for the ADT graph. The ADT graph is a bit different from other ADTs in that once you create it, you do not add, remove, or retrieve components. Instead, you use a graph to answer questions based on the relationships among its vertices. We'll divide the graph operations into the two Java interfaces. You can use the operations in the first interface to create the graph and to obtain basic information such as the number of vertices. The second interface specifies operations such as the traversals and path searches that we discussed earlier in this chapter. For convenience, we define a third interface, graph interface, that combines the first two interfaces. To make these interfaces as general as possible, we have them specify graphs that are either directed or undirected, and weighted or unweighted. The first interface appears in listing 29.1. The generic type T represents, represents the, the data type of the objects that, that label the graphs vertices. So this is the continuation of that listing. And so you can look that over. And here's the, the part three of that. So um, let's think of an example. So suppose that the, the class undirected graph implements the interface basic graph interface as part as given in listing 29.1. Um, and in the, the package graph package, the following statements create the, the graph shown in figure 2922 that we're showing at the moment, which is a portion of the graph of figure 29.6. Okay, here's the, the listing. The, the algorithm discussed earlier in this chapter use graph operations that are not specified in the previous interface. Although we could add these operations to the interface so the client could implement various algorithms, such as the topological sort, we choose not to do so. Instead, methods that implement the graph algorithm will be part of a, of a graph class. And so very interesting stuff if that's something that you're finding yourself interested in. The interface in listing 29.2 specifies these methods. Again, the, the data type of the objects that label the graph's vertices are, are represented by the generic type T. So this is a continuation of um, that listing, and you can look that over at your leisure. And so just to finish up, the interface in listing 29.3 combines a basic graph interface and graph algorithm interface. And that ends this lecture. Thank you very much.